welcome to A Lesson in History. Today, we are going to visit parts of Prince George's County that for many people are unknown treasures. We're sitting on a pier at the National Colonial Farm that overlooks the Potomac River with a view to one of America's most familiar historic sites. With a little imagination, George Washington might be seen waving to us from Mount Vernon on the opposite shore. But there was plenty of history to be made on this side as well. It could be said that on this very spot, Maryland actually began. Back in 1634, a meeting between Leonard Calvert, the first Lord Baltimore, and the local Indians assured the future of the Maryland colony. The Indians were shrewd negotiators. They provided the land for Calvert's followers, and with the thought that the alliance would provide protection from the Susquehannocks, the threatening Indians up north, a bargain was struck and a mostly peaceful coexistence followed. It seemed that everybody wanted to live in Mary's land, and with good reason. The climate was equable, and the land was fertile enough for the crops needed to sustain a new colony. Father Andrew White, one of the early settlers, kept a journal of those early days. It is a chronicle of events as well as a testament to the beauty of the land. Andrew White was almost ecstatic in his description of their wistful country. Regarding the Potomac River, he wrote, Never have I beheld a larger, a larger or more, or more beautiful, beautiful river. The Thames seems a mere rivulet in comparison with it. It is not disfigured with any swamps, but has firm land on each side. Fine groves of trees appear, not choked with briars or bushes or undergrowth, but growing at intervals as if planted by the hand of man, so that you can drive a four-horse carriage wherever you choose through the midst of the trees. White wasn't the first to marvel at Maryland's bounty. Thousands of years before this land was called Maryland, Indians thrived on the banks of the river. This hallowed ground includes many reminders of pre-colonial days, like the ossuary, an ancient Indian burial ground where bones reveal the life of the long dead Indians. Throughout the uh southern Maryland area, particularly in Prince George's County near Piscataway Creek, there is approximately 10,000 years of Indian history. This history can be represented by the many artifacts that can be found in the farmers' fields and along the shore of the Potomac. They include ground stone axe heads, uh, projectile points, also known as arrowheads and spearheads, and of course the sherds or pieces of broken Indian pottery. Henry and Alice Ferguson were the amateur archaeologists who first unearthed these relics back in the 1930s. And they made sure that future generations wouldn't forget the past by donating their land to the National Park Service in the 1960s. The Fergusons moved to Akakeek, Maryland in the 1930s and joined with a group of other people, including Robert Ware Strauss, who was um, later the founder of the Akakeek Foundation, and their interests were in preserving the land along the Potomac River for future generations, especially later on when that land was threatened by development. Alice died in the early 1950s, and when she did, Henry set up a foundation in her memory which would be devoted to education, both of the historical aspect of the area and of the environmental wealth is to be found along Piscataway Creek and along that strip of land across from Mount Vernon on the Potomac River. And the idea was not just to focus on artifacts and, and historic buildings, but to focus on the field crops and the agricultural methods employed in colonial times. And so the idea of, a of the National Colonial Farm arose 
out of this desire to portray the life of the middling farmer, not the, the wealthy uh, landowner of the 18th century, but the average tobacco planter and his family and what their lives were like, what kind of crops they grew, uh, what kind of methods they used in their agricultural implementation. Today's Greater Piscataway Park includes the Hard Bargain and National Colonial Farm. We're at the National Colonial Farm right now. Let's see. Oh, we can visit the kitchen garden or the smokehouse or the necessary. That's the colonial toilet. <laughs> oh, let's go to the barnyard. What do you say, Ken? Many of the domesticated animals, like geese, made their ways to colonial dinner tables. Peacocks and peahens would often grace the lawns and would disrupt the serenity of the farm with their loud and haunting cries. And there were also birds, tasty ones, that lurked in the marsh grasses and wild rice farm of what is today Merkel Wildlife Sanctuary. <laughs> The railbird, also known as the Sora, sought refuge here in the lush landscape of Patuxent River Park. Unfortunately, the cover was not camouflage enough for the railbird. Persistent hunting reduced their numbers to such an extent that hunting was finally restricted. Muskrats also drew legions of trappers to this swampy area. Elaborate traps were set to bring in the highly prized furs. At the nearby Duval Tool Museum, authentic muskrat traps can be seen, along with tobacco presses known as prizes, dental chairs, and other antique tools and devices. Greg, 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 I, I promise I'll visit the dentist next week, please. Uh, I'd just like to get on with this interview for okay. right now, okay? Sure. This is Greg Lewis, and uh, he is the director of the Patuxent River Park, and we're standing here at the Duval Tool Museum, and we have right here some very old dental equipment. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us something about the age of this equipment? Uh, yes, we believe that this uh, equipment dates back to the early 20th century. Uh, it belonged to Dr. Early Baden, a uh, dentist here in Southern Maryland, practiced for over 50 years. Uh, this, uh, he was known as the horse and buggy dentist. He would take this collapsible chair, mm -hmm. along with his other dental instruments and tools, and travel the back roads and country roads to visit his patients. Oh, great. Just what we need. A dentist that makes house calls. Right, right. <laughs> Uh-oh. Now, what is this? Now, you're not going to tell me that this is something that was used in early dentistry. <laughs> no, Ken. Actually, it was uh, used as a, it's a log shackle. It was used in uh, taking uh, heavy timbers and logs out of the woods. Would have been uh, okay, pulled now, uh, by a uh, team of horses. Okay, so you would have attached this to the horses and then right. they would have this would have caught, caught, the, caught the log the and they log. were dragged it out of the woods. Oh, mm -hmm. very good. All along the Patuxent, boats plied the waters of what was Main Street for Colonial Maryland. Towns like Nottingham and Queen Anne grew along the banks. Today, they are mostly ghost towns, inhabited by historical markers and household remnants scattered in the fields. The Patuxent River was a very busy uh, river. Uh, we generally don't think of that today because of, uh, it doesn't represent that today. But uh, it was back then, it was very important for trade. A lot of different interesting areas along the Patuxent. Uh, starting at Queen Anne, we have uh, Queen Anne was back in about 1706, uh, along with Nottingham, were established along the Patuxent River. Uh, it's interesting to find out that they called uh, uh, Queen Anne, and it was probably named after Queen Anne of England, uh, it was actually called the Little Forest uh, because it was very rich. And of course, uh, they were very much in tobacco. Here again, uh, horse racing was, uh, was done there. Uh, you know, people came from around to watch, watch that. Now, along with Nottingham was also another uh, seaport along the Patuxent. And it's, it's interesting, you can go down there today and there's hardly any evidence that there were houses or, or even a settlement there. But it was a very busy settlement because uh, you had a lot of the people around the area were actually uh, farmers, 
they raised tobacco, and of course, tobacco was a cash crop uh, back during those days. But it was said, in talking to people, historians, that uh, George Washington used to come down to Nottingham and watch horse racing from the road that goes from the river out to what is now 382. Way down here at the end of the Patuxent River, the town of Eagle Harbor sits next to the water like the airy of its namesake. Formerly a black resort town, Eagle Harbor can now claim to be Prince George's County's smallest incorporated community. But what it lacks in size, Eagle Harbor makes up in historic significance. So isolation is not as bad as it might seem. Eagle Harbor is a major urban area when compared to Charlestown, the first county seat. Before Upper Marlboro became the center of Prince George's County in 1721, Charlestown was downtown. When Prince George's came into being in April 1696, Charlestown, known to the locals as Mount Calvert, could boast of a few inns and stores, a church, and all the trappings of colonial justice, stocks, pillories, cages, whipping posts. What? Today, all that remains of Mount Calvert is a single stately residence evocative of bygone days. One of the interesting things, I think, as I was in that area over a period of time, had a chance to walk down to the Calvert Mansion. And uh, when you go down, just a beautiful area overlooking near the Patuxent River Park, which is now called Jug Bay. At one particular time, there was uh, I understand there was a, actually a courthouse there. There was a jail, but as you see it today, that would not indicate that. Uh, they used to say ships would pull in there, unload their cargo, pick up tobacco. And uh, the interesting thing, when the crew came in, the crew would actually uh, have maybe a night out on the town, they'd go out and, and they'd get maybe alcohol and bring it back and drink it, and then they would throw the kegs overboard, and that's how uh, part of the Patuxent Park was called Jug Bay, because a lot of the uh, cask or the wooden barrels were thrown over. Mia, hmm? did you bring a road map? No. Well, uh, I don't see any inns for lost travelers around here. Uh, mm. look, I, I know the Indians could tell direction from the moss on the side of a tree, but this city slicker needs a road sign. I promise we'll get Ken back to more familiar terrain in time for our next edition of A Lesson in History. See you next time. Bye.